Okay, folks, uh, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar. Uh, I, I'm uh, Stephen Kinsella. I'm a professor of economics here at the Kemi Business School at the University of Limerick. Um, we'll be admitting people uh, in, in the next little while as, um, as we go. Um, and I think we, we I can ask my uh, colleagues, Tobacco and Mary, to uh, uh, do that as uh, as we're we're going to keep going. So um, let me just share some slides and then uh, kick off. And just to remind everyone, if you want to uh, ask a question, um, uh, please just shoot into the uh, questions and answers um, uh, bar there, and we will be uh, more more than happy to um, uh, uh, we'll be more than happy to take your comments and questions. So let's start off by um, let's start off by uh, well <laughs> let's start off by 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 making the uh, thing full screen. So hopefully, can everyone see the presenter form of this? Like I on, uh, one of the issues with Microsoft Teams is I can't actually see what everyone else sees, which is a bit annoying. So hopefully, has that uh, gone full screen um, for for everyone? Um, if if it has happy days, I will um, start kick off. So my plan here is to go from the very macro to the uh, quite micro. Um, I've spoken with um, um, uh, colleagues at the BSTAI, and thank you very much to uh, Maraid and all the team at BSTAI for uh, helping to organize this event. Um, these this is one of these um, kind of key partnerships that that. As head of department, I'm, I'm very interested in in working on, and I hope that everyone involved um, uh, understands that it's a it's a collaboration, and that you don't get these things done on your own. Um, and I'll I'll thank uh, key people later on. And so for the next sort of 45 minutes, my plan is to talk uh, about the following few things. Um, uh, but before I do that, uh, just to tell you that yesterday on the campus we had an amazing day. So we had 6,000 people on the campus. Um, uh, wandering around uh, in our Explore UL day. So if you're on Instagram, if you're on Twitter, if you're on TikTok, have a look at uh, the Explore UL tag. You'll see the kind of stuff people were getting up to. You'll get a flavor of the campus and what it was like. And hopefully some of you were actually there uh, yesterday enjoying the um, the various events and enjoying uh, the um, enjoying the various events and enjoying the uh, uh, festivities because it really was brilliant to see everybody on on campus again so just a reminder there have a look at that um uh, it's it's genuinely fun and, and and really good to see everyone here again um but today um for the next sort of we'll talk for about four or five minutes or so um, and i'll spend about 20 minutes talking and then we'll take about 20 minutes for cop uh, for questions and uh, and and comments and and uh, uh, any ideas like that because the goal is really to help you as you prepare for the leaving certificate in a couple of um, months time um, and to give you a sense of what's happening um, at the very macro level and at the micro level to give you some sense of the kind of major policy questions and also to give you some resources so after this uh, uh, little talk uh, these slides and the data underneath the slides there's going to be a lot of charts in this you'll see them they'll all be made available to you there's links to where all the data came from and to the papers that i'll be talking about they're all in the in the, in the notes um, section of the PowerPoint deck, and they'll be sent to everybody who registered for this event. Um, so hopefully it'll be a resource for your teachers and for all the students who are involved and just for everybody generally. Um, and, and I hope that you all um, get as much out of it uh, as, I, as I do. I have to say I love teaching um, economics. I love learning about economics. I really, really love thinking about economics. It's, um, it's uh, the only sensible way I have found to think coherently about the world. Um, I'm studying this for the last 20 odd years and um, as a professional economist, the most amazing thing about economics is that it never gets boring. Um, uh, it's often caricatured as being a boring subject. Literally nothing could be further from the truth. It is the most exciting subject. Um, we're going to talk about four really important um, uh, policies here, really important things. The first is the war in Ukraine. You can't really talk about what's happening in the macro economy, the big picture, without talking about the war in Ukraine. So we're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about it from the perspective of Ireland. 
And this is because your leaving cert is coming up. You're going to be asked about, you know, things like inflation, things like wage price spirals, um, things like uh, GDP changes. And, you know, it, it's good for you to know these things. But obviously all of this is caused by um, the uh, Ukraine war. It's caused by uh, the COVID shock. It's caused by Brexit and so on and so forth. Um, we'll also talk about the consequences of retirement changes. So we'll look about we'll look at aging, and we'll look at productivity. Um, if you're the kind of person, if you're the average person taking the leaving certificate, you're probably 17 uh, or, or 18 years old, which means you were born in 2004, 2005, uh, 2006, which means you'll very likely live to see the 22nd century. So the average um, uh, uh, life expectancy for your cohort is in the 90s, and many of you will live to be 100 years old. So if you think about a world where you are still alive in 2122, you, the, the students watching this, you get a sense of the kind of long run societal questions that we're asking. Um, and that we are, we will have to ask ourselves uh, over the, the coming century as things like an aging population, a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis all crunch on the state at the same time. Then we'll move to micro uh, 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 and talk about two, two key policies which are going to affect you specifically and uh, the Irish economy more generally. The first is minimum unit pricing. And so the problem with minimum unit pricing is that, of course, it doesn't allow the market to find uh, its, its true um, its true equilibrium, but also we have a fundamental distinction. Is alcohol uh, a luxury good or is it a demerit good or a gift good? Is it something that you want uh, and that you will feel better if you can if you can hold like a diamond or, or is it something much worse like gruel, right? It depends. And will the minimum unit pricing law achieve its objectives? The second thing we're going to talk about is uh, uh, something that has come up on Twitter a lot, which is uh, what's going to happen to the banking sector with the uh, departure of Ulster Bank and uh, KBC. So these are two very large banks, very large mortgage books, and they're both exiting the Irish market uh, this year. And so what, what will happen to a more concentrated markets? And uh, we'll talk about the implications. We'll also talk about the Hirsch, Hirschman Herpendahl Index, um, which is a measure of the concentration in that sector. All right. So let's kick on and talk about the war in Ukraine. The chart you're looking at here, uh, folks, is a GDP growth chart. So it's done by year, 2017, 2018, 2019, and so forth. And what it includes are the forecasts by the International Monetary Fund at the start of 2022 and today. Okay, so what you should be looking at here is you're looking at the entire globe by continent. So Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania, right? So the entire globe, global growth. Um, and it's GDP growth, so you should remember GDP is the sum of consumption, investment, government expenditure, exports, and imports. And that's co co collated by the statistical agencies of every state. But then, of course, because it's collected in the same way, you can compare. So you can compare the GDP of Ireland and the GDP of um, Nigeria, say. And what we do basically is add them up, add the GDP of the world up last year, add the GDP of the world up this year, and compute a percentage change. So the annual percentage change. And so you can see if the green uh, uh, bar there is Africa, you can see that in 2017, the entire continent of Africa grew 3.4%. And then in 2018, 3.2, 2019, 2.6. It fell, obviously, due to COVID in 2020, and then it rebounded to 5.6% in uh, 2021, and then fell again in 2022. Africa is obviously deeply exposed to Ukraine, um, particularly because Ukraine is a massive exporter of um, wheat, and countries like Egypt uh, will use an enormous amount of wheat uh, to feed their populations. And you can see then that the first uh, um, um, a global growth for, um, for the GDP growth forecast for uh, Africa was revised down to 3.6%. It then got revised down again to 2.6%. So we can see each time what's actually ha happening here is the Ukraine war has revised sharply down global GDP growth But what I'd for the entire planet. But what I'd like you to look at here is Europe, the most affected area uh, um, of, of, of all of these um, uh, regions 
In fact, by the COVID crisis was Europe, minus 6%. So a very large drop in economic output caused by the lockdowns um, uh, in, in Europe. It recovered strongly to 5.2%, it's the yellow bar there, um, and then it collapsed, and now it's at 0.9%. And this is now getting worse. So we should expect to see low or almost no growth in Europe this year. So there's going to be, so which, which heightens the probability of a global recession in 2023. So if you if you think about a recession as six months of negative GDP growth, um, obviously the idea of a global recession uh, caused by the Ukraine war and by the kind of things that we're talking about later, it will moderate certain things like inflation, but it'll also make other aspects of the uh, uh, crisis worse. For example, things like budget deficits. But that's a really big picture. You don't really get much bigger of a picture than global GDP growth. Um, and this is the kind of stuff you get from the IMF. And it's also very important that you understand that it, these are highly uncertain figures. So we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it, w we have a good sense that the headwinds are not great for the global economy um, moving forward. This chart on the left shows you the, the uh, index of global supply chain pressure. What you're looking at is a, is a measurement of how long it takes to get a shipping container from one part of the world over to the other, from China over to San Francisco, um, um, from uh, Liverpool down to South America and so forth. And so each time you're looking at that, the, 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 you're, you're starting to see that this is very correlated. If you look, don't look at the big spike at the end of the chart, don't look at this bit, you look at this bit over here before the, the COVID crisis, you can see it's very much cyclical. It moves up and down with what economists call the business cycle, the amount of uh, investment and uh, activity that's happening each time uh, uh, the, there's a ramp up in investment, people will buy more stuff. And uh, when investment cools down because there's some recession or there's a global crisis, then supply chain pressures ease. What's actually happened is after COVID, there was a massive impact on, on global supply chains because the, China, which is the world's factory, shut down. Um, and so it became harder to get stuff. And because it became harder to get stuff, the price of that stuff went up. OK, um, the other kind of major issue now is that restarting those global supply chains, it, it takes a long time. It takes about 18 months to really work through these issues. And in the meantime, uh, as we've started recovering from COVID, as, uh, 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 as, as the globe has started recovering from COVID, um, we've had the war in Ukraine, but we've also had another series of lockdowns in China. So very large areas in China, massive cities, in fact, are actually locked down now exactly as we were this time last year. Um, and there are much more uh, harsh crackdowns than perhaps we were used to. So this is all translating into a couple of different things. The first and most important of which is inflation. So if you look at the chart on the right now, you're looking at headline inflation is that green line on the right hand side. Um, headline inflation has shot way up. Um, and this is for Ireland. Um, if you're looking at global supply chain pressures on the left, but this is uh, con contributions to changes in inflation in Ireland now. So you're just looking at this is the this is what you and your parents and your teachers are experiencing on a daily basis when you go to fill the car or when you go to buy things, the price of things is rising. What things? Well, clearly two things. The first is energy prices are really shooting up. Um, and you can see they're being, they're being, they, they are being moderated by uh, policy. So the policy system is stepping in to subsidize um, um, lots of households. You can see there's been a shooting up and it and drops back down again. But you can see that overall headline inflation is going way, way, way higher than um, uh, one might expect. And just for interest, I compared it to unprocessed food, so vegetables and things like that. You can see the price of vegetables haven't really changed. The price of jam hasn't really changed. The price of, you know, butter hasn't really changed. The price of electricity has changed. The price of uh, fuel has changed. The price of making sure your home is heated has changed. And that's bleeding into lots and lots of other things. So we're seeing very large changes in inflation in America. It's above 7%. In Europe, it's above 5%. In Ireland, it's above, it's 6.7%, in fact. There's very, very large changes in inflation. And what that does is that makes people poorer. So I want to put this in its historical context. So this is the, this is the Irish inflation rate. The, the chart on the left is the inflation rate since 1943. 
right? And the beauty of economic data is that it allows you to contextualize things in a clever way. If you look at this, look at the axis. The axis there says 25, right? So in the 1970s, when there was the last time there was a major supply shock in the global economy, inflation was running north of 20%. That means a fifth of the purchasing power of the value you were able to generate with your paycheck was going away on an annual basis. So a hundred pounds worth of stuff in 1974 only bought you 80 pounds worth of stuff in 1980, in 1975, right? So people were getting poorer on a much faster basis. <clears throat> Interest rates at that time um, were like 12, 13%. Right now, they're 0.1%. So there's a very big difference between then and now, but it's important to point out uh, where we are in terms of our spike in inflation is down here. This is us, okay? So historically, we should be able to place the ramp up in inflation uh, from 20, uh, from 1943 to 2021 in this context. It's not that much higher. And if you add in the 2022 variable, you're about there, just slightly over the five lines. So nothing close to where we were at, but if you look at the historical average over this period, we're at or about the historical average. Now, if you look at the actual inflation rate over the last three years, so here we're looking at the monthly inflation rate, so the monthly inflation rate since 2019, what you should be looking at here and what you should really focus on is the very sharp increase in January, in January 2021. Okay, um, and again, uh, sorry, January, yeah, January 2021, and then a very sharp increase in, in January 2022. These are uh, two, two um, points at which the market realizes that the input costs for things like electricity and gas and oil are rising and they start passing that on to the consumer and that's the moment that people start going wow okay let's let's raise prices and of course making people on fixed incomes much poorer and again just to repeat i just want to repeat that chart below i showed you this chart already this is the contribution to changes in inflation what you're looking at here fundamentally is an energy supply shock Okay. The price of energy has risen. We import energy. And because we import energy, we're forced to push those costs on down the line to other things like transport, accommodation, and, and food processing, and so on and so forth. Well, while this is a cause for concern, policymakers should be worried about it. You know, we're, we're putting it as a larger context, it's not the worst thing in the world, particularly as it erodes the real value of our debt. Um, and we're a highly indebted um, group of people at the moment. So in summary, the first bit is over. Uh, the Ukraine crisis, like the COVID crisis, is best understood as a supply shock. So if you do an aggregate supply, aggregate demand uh, uh, um, sequence, you will understand basically supply is just pulling way back, which is forcing uh, the price up. Okay, energy is more expensive, inflation goes through the cost channel, households get poorer, and those on fixed incomes get much poorer still. What's the government going to do? It's going to step into subsidize, particularly people on fixed incomes, and therefore the budget deficit will rise. However, there's another way of thinking about it, and this is how the Department of Finance thinks about it. Uh, it thinks about the Ukraine crisis as a terms of trade shock. So you may not have heard this term before, um, and you but if not, don't worry, your teachers will tell you all about it. Basically, in terms of trade shock is when the cost of importing rises. Your import bill goes up relative to your export bill. And what that does is that forces very large changes in the trade balance. Uh, your current account, which is X minus M, that changes and output. So GDP will shrink just because of this. And because of this terms of trade shock, um, we, we find ourselves in a moment where sometimes the government is not able to pay its own way. I don't mean the Irish government in this case, we're part of the European monetary system, we're gonna be fine. But countries like uh, Sri Lanka, for example, have had exactly the same thing happen to them as Ireland has. But unlike Ireland, they don't have reserves and they do have lots and lots of debt. They're not part of a monetary union. They're already in a bit of trouble fiscally. And so what's gonna happen? They're gonna end up defaulting on their, their debt because they just can't pay it back. If the price of your main input goes up and you are not bringing in any more money to compensate for that price increase, 
you're probably going to have to tell your creditor, sorry, guys, I can't pay. Terms of trade shocks are very important because they tend to be associated in the past, at least, with large scale debt defaults. And if you have smaller, poorer countries defaulting on their debt, that means austerity. It means the average person in these societies ends up uh, footing the bill and having a really hard time. You know, things like medical expenses don't get paid. So it's a very important moment for the global economy and something that policymakers will be coming back to again and again and again. All right. I want to talk to you about in retirement now. So moving from the big, big, big picture to a long, a big, the big picture today to the long picture tomorrow. The chart on the left shows you the population projection by age cohort. The light green there, people age 20 to 64, what we now understand as the working age population. And you can see that that is growing um, uh, over time. You, you might ask why there aren't 7 million people in this chart. That's what the census expects. That's because lots of them are children and um, we don't want children working. Uh, um, uh, and this is so it's it, it's it's not a great uh, uh, measure. But the dark blue, dark dark green rather line is that's uh, people age 65 plus. So uh, I think uh, I will retire from the University of Limerick in 2054. So just at the end of that um, uh, period at at 65. And so when I look at this, I see myself. Okay. Now you, if you're 17 years old, you probably will not retire over this period you you any of you that are listening to this will probably do 40 to 50 years of, of work so you'll probably retire towards the very 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 end of this chart maybe 2070 maybe 2075 some of you um so you're at the very end of this uh, um cohort and obviously what happens is you start off in the 20 to 64 cohort which is where i am now and you will be in three or four years time and then you move <laughs> into the 65 plus cohort, uh, assuming you survive and you don't migrate, you stay here. What we're seeing is Ireland's population is aging and it's aging extremely rapidly. So if you look at this, uh, the slope of this line here, I don't know if you can see my, 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 my picture, but if the slope of this line here is very steep relative to many other OECD countries. And what that means in practice, folks, is that, um, Ireland will become a lot grayer as a society. We will, we're not, we're not going to look the same way. We're not going to sound the same way. We're not going to buy the same things. We're not going to um, uh, treat each other in the same way. And most importantly, we're not going to be as productive. So your teachers will tell you that productivity, which is output per worker, the amount of stuff that gets produced either in goods or in services or something else, output per worker is a measure of productivity. And when societies get older, they produce less. So they're, and productivity is the key to long run growth. So this is a big worry. We know that older people need more, uh, spend, more spending on health. We know health inflation is three times the regular inflation level because uh, because of technological change. And we, we also know um, that we will need to spend more on pensions. Which brings me to the next uh, chart. So a much older society in, in Ireland. We're one of the youngest societies in Europe now. In 10 years time, we'll be one of the oldest, um, just because of that flip. Um, so social welfare spending on pensions as a percentage of what's called gross modified gross national income, GNI star. It's a bit like GDP, but it corrects for the influence of the multinationals in, in Ireland. You're looking at a projection based on a model. Um, and these are, th I'm, I'm showing you three projections here. The first is the baseline. So right now, like today, we spend about 6% of gross national income on, on pensions, right? So it's 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 not small amounts of money. Um, you're talking about two, you know, it's about 100, 100 million a year, something like that, uh, but it, it, it's quite large. What you're looking at here is it's gonna double pretty much between now, and this is the baseline. So look at the green line there. We see it more or less uh, doubling, going to about 11% from just under six to just above, uh, just nearly 12. And then there are two scenarios here. The first scenario, which keeps it a bit lower, is higher employment of older workers. Like I fully expect to be working at 69 years old, assuming I'm surviving. Um, I fully expect to be working at 75 years old uh, because I like working. I'm, like I said, I'm really interested in, in the economy, I don't particularly see that changing. I love my job, I love what I'm doing. I'm pretty sure the University of Limerick's gonna kick me out, but I don't think I'll stop working. 
Um, and, and if you imagine that that will mean I probably won't be uh, uh, claiming a pension in that case, um, uh, because I, 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 I won't need to, um, you can see that th th that social welfare spending line will go down a bit. Um, but the bit it goes down instead of being 12%, it's like 10%. You're still spending two. You're, you're still saving two percent of gross national income in 2069 is probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of euros. Not a small amount of money, um, but you can see that there are other scenarios where things go up. So the black line there is higher life expectancy. So people just live longer. You will all, as I said, live longer. If you live longer, that and you and you're you qualify for a state pension the state will continue to pay you until you die. Uh, and you may actually have a, a, a dependence, they may get some portion of that pension and they may uh, 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 keep, keep going. So we can easily see a situation where somebody retires, let's say in 2075, and the Irish, Irish government are still paying their pension in 2125, 50 years later, right? Um, so in that situation, higher life expectancy vastly increases the, um, the costs uh, on the state. And remember, you're living longer, not only the pension expenditure going up, health expenditure is going up, productivity is going down. So there's a very, very important change uh, on the Irish economy. Just to give you a sense of scale here, this is a bunch of different countries. And we're looking at the old age dependency ratio between now and 2075. So what we do is, oh, and, I, and all we do with this line, right, is we divide the proportion of the population aged 20 to 64 by the proportion of the population age 65 plus. Okay, um, so you can see for Canada in 2075 that number is 54.5. Okay, so that's that's pretty good, but not great. Um, you want it to be, you know, uh, uh, nice and low. Lower the better because it means there's more young people paying for all the older people. So contrast, say, the People's Republic of China, which is the blue line there at 58.8 in 27, 2075, with India in 2075, 37, much, much, much lower. There's a much younger population, much lower life expectancy. So the old age dependency ratio is much lower. Uh, the United States, down the bottom right there, it has a, a, a lower uh, dependency ratio as well. Uh, this is because its life expectancy is actually falling. So the United States, uniquely amongst global the global economy, the entire country's life expectancy is falling because of the state of their health system. In fact, and you can see there for the European Union, it's 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 uh, it, it's pretty high. They they only chart out to 2050, and there's Ireland there uh, in the middle uh, at about 50.9. So nowhere near as bad, let's say, as uh, China. Their economy is m is going to be much older uh, because of the one child per one one family one child policy. And that they instituted a couple of decades ago, um, but you can see that, like, com you can compare, say, Ireland uh, at, 20, at 50.9 and Japan over there at 75.3, which is the highest age dependency ratio. So, more, one of the oldest societies in the world, and you know, we, we can see in your, if you like, one of the beautiful things about economics, you can see what's happening with uh, Japan. Um, uh, you can see what what's going to happen to Ireland when you look at Japan. You know. Um, uh, and and, uh, and these are the kinds of things that uh, keep economists up at night because we know what we need to do to fix these things. But in order to fix these things, we have to make big policy changes today and people don't want to make those policy changes today. The, uh, Emmanuel Macron nearly lost the French election uh, in, in the French presidential election because he said, I'm going to raise the pension age in France from 55 to 65. And people were like, we're not voting for you if you want to do that, right? So you can see that there will be vast problems. So people who are living for longer, they're going to work for longer too. Health expenditures are going to go up. Productivity levels may go down. Uh, pensions at 65, folks, they are absolutely sustainable into the long term. Uh, if taxation levels don't rise overly, um, but there are only three options. Either you reduce the pension amount, it's not really a runner, uh, having pensioners in poverty is a problem that Ireland solved in the 2000s. So it used to be a massive problem in Irish society, older people um, being very, very poor. 
Uh, so it's not really a runner. We reduce the pension amount. You can force people to work longer, move the move it from 65 to 66 to 67 to 68. Um, this is actually likely to happen in the short run, um, but it's unpopular because, of course, people don't want to, to be told they have to. Um, uh, the other thing to do is to force employers and employees to save for their own pensions. Uh, in this case, it, impl it imposes a much higher cost on employers and employees to, to, to save for their own retirement. In that exact situation, um, people will complain because the costs are going to go up. The costs to being an employee will go up because you're for being forced to save, and the costs to being an employer will go up because your employer PRSI will rise as well. So there's no easy answer to this. Um, uh, there's no easy answer to this. The easiest thing most politicians would like to do is kick it into the cur kick it into the long grass and not worry about it. Um, but the minute you do that, you store up problems into the future. Uh, there is an opportunity in Ireland to fix this today when we're one of the youngest uh, societies in Europe. Uh, in 10 years time, it'd be much, much, much harder to do. Moving on, minimum unit pricing. So it's a floor price for a unit of alcohol. Very simple. Um, uh, 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 you can see the supply and demand diagram there. All you basically do is if the equilibrium is kind of here uh, between supply and demand, you simply figure out a minimum unit price uh, that's above that because what you want to do is you want to restrict demand. You want to have people, instead of demanding this much, they want that to go back to this much. And you want to be able to target it so that younger people who are much more price sensitive and much more affected by uh, uh, um, uh, prices uh, are discouraged from binge drinking because that's the real problem. The problem is where, where there's a vast oversupply at really low prices and people simply uh, uh, drink too much. And when they drink too much, we know for a fact the health consequences are devastating into the future for them and maybe even for their children. So the big question is, is, is alcohol luxury good or not? And the other big question is, what's its elasticity? So if you increase the price of something, you force me to make a choice. Do I respond to the price change or do I just put up with it, right? If I, res if I can respond to the price change in an easy way, we call that elastic. It's demand elastic. So what? Th think about pencils. If I've got green pencils and red pencils and somebody triples the cost of the red pencil, I'm like, I don't care. I'll just buy some green pencils, whatever. So I'm, it's, it's multiply elastic. I'm not that affected by, the, by it. It's grand. So if you increase the price of um, uh, blue colored alcohol and leave the price of green colored alcohol uh, on its own, I don't really care. I'll just buy the green stuff. Right. So the availability of substitutes really matters. The availability of good substitutes matters. And the, a very good question is like, are you if you go to, to buy alcohol or, and you can, and it's more expensive, are you going to just buy less of it? In which case you've you've limited the harm in some sense, or are you going to switch over to something else? Like I mean, you could be you could say, oh, I've decided to become extremely healthy. This is grand. I'm gonna you know buy buy some you know nuts and uh, 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 you know some 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 free weights and become much much fitter. Uh, or you might say, do you know what? The price of illegal drugs is actually looking pretty good to me now. I might have a go at this instead. So it's 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 like what do you what what would you like to do here? Are we going to disincentivize? good behavior and sort of force people into uh, uh, less positive channels, we're not totally sure. It does interestingly pull up the argument of whether you want to legalize drugs or not, and legalize illegal drugs like cocaine and, and uh, um, uh, um, cannabis and so forth. Um, but fundamentally, uh, these two things matter. What's the elasticity of demand with and the elasticity of income with respect to alcohol? and is alcohol a luxury good or not? Well, it turns out that when incoming, when uh, you increase a price for alcohol, and this has been seen in Scotland and in England and in other places, uh, uh, demand for uh, alcohol reduces significantly. Okay, it, it 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 reduces significantly. However, when income increases, so when people get a bit more money, the demand for alcohol increases disproportionately. OK, it is perceived to be a luxury good by working class families. So when you get a bit more money, you'll buy a lot more alcohol. OK, so very, very important. And so 
when consumers are inelastic or unresponsive with respect to uh, minimum prices, their reduction in consumption will be relatively small. So the policy may not do what you think. OK, and that what I'm showing in, in, in the next diagram is this is what happens when you're very inelastic with respect to supply and inelastic with respect to demand. You don't really see a big change in behavior and not you don't see a big change in quantity demanded and quantity supplied that you expected. People react and they change. OK, and so we, we, we these are the two questions that we will find ourselves asking. Is alcohol a luxury good for working class families in particular in Ireland? And what is the elasticity of that demand with respect to both uh, the, the stuff itself, the availability of closed substitutes and income? Remember, what else is happening? Inflation is going up. The price of the stuff is rising anyway. OK, so it's an important point, I think, uh, uh, that we will continue to return to. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, what is going to happen that with the de departure of Ulster Bank and KBC? So, so we already know that the Irish um, banking sector is extremely concentrated and uh, there, there aren't really that many other banks that you can go to, um, to to open up a new bank account. And you have to open up a new bank account. If you're a customer of Ulster Bank or KBC, you have to open one because these fellas are leaving. So what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Um, you don't really have that many choices and it's not like the banks are falling over themselves to offer you, you know, more uh, um, more inducements to come. You don't see people going, come join our bank. It will be great. You know, you, you don't you just don't have those. Uh, you just don't have those um, ads. You don't you're not hearing them. Right. So uh, uh, higher concentration is typically bad in any in any sector. It's bad in Google. Google owning 90 plus percent of search is a bad thing. Um, if there was only one university in, in, in all of Ireland and it was the University of Limerick, that would be a bad thing. We fundamentally compete for your business, if you like. Uh, uh, we hope that you will come and study at the University of Limerick and you know not go to Cork or, 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 or Dublin or whatever. Um, we want you to stay, uh, come to us, right? Um, but we're incentivized to compete for what you're doing and for, for your uh, business, if you like. Um, and that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Um, but but I, I think that it's probably true, and most economists will tell you, higher concentration within any market is typically bad. We don't want concentration uh, in the system. And we know from looking at particular studies of uh, banks, banks, banking systems around the world that, that where, where you see lots and lots of concentration, in, uh, there's lots and lots of higher interest rates. So the average consumer pays a much higher interest rate in banking systems that are much more concentrated. Why? Because you can't shop around. So you, you pay a higher interest rate. Banks make a, make a much bigger profit. These are called monopoly profits or oligopoly profits. They're able to charge you more and give themselves an easy life. Um, so one measure of this is the HHI index, the herpendahl hirschman index, and it's the sum of the squared ma bank market shares, right? So it's the sum of a squared series. Um, and it's a benchmark measure of banking concentration. It's actually a legal uh, measure as well. And what you're looking at here is the HHI index in Ireland um, from 1997 until 2020. You should see, obviously, in the late 2010s and, 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 and early 2020s, banks consolidated. So banks were banks like uh, uh, Anglo-Irish Bank um, ceased to be banks. They were they were removed from the system because they failed and other banks like KBC came into the market and now are leaving. So it kind of evened itself out. But now we're moving towards a much more concentrated um, banking system again. Uh, and again, the literature would suggest that uh, that's a bad thing. We would, would not want to bring in more um, more banks. Um, so there's no particular reason, for example, why you can't uh, go with a Danish bank or a Lith Lithuanian bank or or, um, you know, a, Latvian bank, let's say, and we are starting to see some um, fintech companies like N26 and Revolut coming into the system and asking you to open up a bank account with them because even though they're, they're, they're headquartered in Germany and Lithuania, respectively, they're able to trade with you thanks to the European banking system. The question is, will the average Irish person pay their salary into a bank headquartered in Lithuania or Germany? We're not totally sure, um, but we are seeing vast innovation in the sector with you know, uh, 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 fintech uh, companies. The question is, will it be enough um, for the banking sector um, over the next year or two? We will see. So let me finish uh, uh, by, by talking about what economics is. 
um, and then we'll take a few questions. So economics is, is fundamentally about optimization. It's about what is the best thing you think you're doing, right? I think the best thing I can do with my time this morning is talk to you. Um, your teachers think that too, obviously, or that you wouldn't be here. I think that is certainly the case. If I could think of a better thing to do, I would go off and do that. It might not be the actual, strictly speaking, best thing. Maybe I should be in the gym. Maybe I should be working working uh, 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 in a hedge fund. You know, maybe I should be digging a road. I don't know. But right now, I, given where I've been in the past, this is my best use of my time. Equal, economics is also about equilibrium. It's this idea that, you know, the world is, 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 is never fully in balance. But if you think about, start from a position of balance and think about how things might change, it's a very useful way of thinking about the world. I've given you one example of that with the minimum unit pricing, but you'll see a lot of that with your teachers. Empiricism. So economics is all about data. It's not a lot about theory. I know you've learned a lot of theory, but in the in the world of economics, as it's practiced by professional PhD economists, it's all about data. It's all about what is happening to the world. And the best economists in the world now use data sets with hundreds of millions of points of uh, uh, illumination in them to make big, big, big claims about um, um, social social stratification, where things go. It's an incredibly exciting field at the moment. Um, causal inference: If we do X, then Y will happen. If we do X, then Y will happen. The Nobel Prize was just awarded to people who, were, who really refined this uh, uh, notion in economics. So we can say with some confidence, if you do X, Y will happen. That really helps policymakers. If you increase the minimum unit pricing by 75 cent, this will happen, right? Those kind of questions. We want to be useful to policymakers. We want to make the country better for people. And that's why we always have a focus on policy, policy, policy. That's what we teach here at the University of Limerick. It's policy, policy, policy. How does X affect Y in the real world? If you don't have an answer for that, you're probably not doing economics. You might be doing some kind of maths or something, but it's it's really the focus on the real world that we will bring um, to you if you come and do our courses. And I have some like marketing stuff here. Uh, if you uh, When you click the links, uh, on these on these pages, you'll take it'll take you to the various courses. You'll see the BBS, the Bachelor of Arts in Business, um, and the BA in Law and Accounting, and it's uh, it's really cool. And you can click the prospectuses there. So what I'll do is I'll stop uh, now, um, uh, hopefully, and I will um, I'll keep the slides going, but I might ask um, I might ask uh, uh, colleagues for some questions. Um, so. Uh, Mairead um, uh, asks, uh, thank you, Mairead. Uh, uh, many students are concerned about who gets the extra cash from the MUP. They ask, why doesn't the government just tax the cheaper alcohol instead? So the who gets the cash? The answer is the government. It, it, it collects the tax as an excise tax, in fact. Um, and the, what the government said is it will ring fence that money in order to make sure um, that, uh, in order to make sure that the, um, that the uh, uh, there are like health promotion activities and stuff. Uh, why doesn't the government just tax the cheaper alcohol instead? Uh, well, in principle, it, it it should, or I mean, you could you could tax say alcohol that's targeted specifically at younger people. Um, but then the I guess the companies that are involved in that would probably shift their shift their um, behavior. So there's always these behavioral effects um, with respect to taxes. If you tax people's windows, they'll 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 put fewer windows in the house and so forth. Question from the students, are banks better regulated now than during the bank crisis? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, 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 very good. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, but are students better regulated now? Are banks, <laughs> students are very well regulated. Are banks um, uh, uh, regulated now than during the banking crisis? And the answer is absolutely yes. But particularly, they, they've been stopped from lending out more money than they can take back in effectively by uh, uh, forcing consumers, like if you want to get a mortgage, you can only borrow 92 percent uh, of your mortgage um, and you have to have a certain amount saved. You have to have a very good uh, banking history and then they, they'll only let you borrow a certain number uh, of certain uh, uh, percentage of your income. So you can only borrow 3.5 times your income. Um, so uh, Mairead says, 
Uh, O'Sullivan says, will families with alcoholics suffer more with MUP? Uh, yes, I would imagine they would because the, uh, the alcoholic is addicted to this stuff. The alcoholic doesn't really have a choice about it. Um, so, so they will suffer disproportionately. Um, and a great question, is that fair? Very often in economics, you'll get trade-offs between um, you get trade-offs between equity and others. So here's another question. Is there something the government can do to decrease the age of the population? Um, well, there's three things that we can do to decrease the age of the population. The first is um, uh, uh, have more kids, right? So if there was an incentive to have more children, um, then obviously the, the level of the population would, uh, would, would change. Um, that's a lot of work, obviously, for, for, for women um, who, bear dist who, who literally bear the children, but also bear the... Um, uh, costs of child rearing disproportionately relative to men. A huge amount of studies on this now. Um, but the other thing that we can do is is import people who are younger. Um, so uh, right now we have thousands of uh, uh, people coming from Ukraine. Um, if you did a census tomorrow, you would find these are young, uh, typically uh, uh, young women with families. So the average age in a certain area would drop. Uh, I'm not suggesting we start a war to get younger people, but if we welcomed uh, younger families into Ireland, we would decrease uh, the age of the population on average very easily. So inward migration is the answer. Uh, another thing that you can do um, to 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 make sure that this this thing works, and make sure that the retirement issue is kind of solved, is make sure that people are saving a lot earlier. The earlier people start saving because of compounding the more likely it is they're going to be able to afford uh, a future. If you think that everyone on this call is in their 20s, um, uh, uh, if you start saving now, you know, one euro a week saved now, if it compounds and compounds and compounds and compounds, uh, it'll get much, 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 much bigger over time. This is the magic of compounding. little statistic for you. Um, most of Warren Buffett's wealth, um, in fact, the vast vast, vast bulk of his wealth, he's the, one of the richest men on earth, was actually acquired after he was uh, 70 years old. And he started investing when he was 12 years old. So if you start young and just let it build up, you'll be you'll be grand. Uh, let me thank you all for your time and attention. And uh, thank you very much to, to Edna Ford and her colleagues for, for uh, the kind words. And thank you.